Welcome everyone to this webinar of the Linguistics Society of America. Today we have another installment in our Meet the Authors series, in which authors of recently published articles in the journal Language share their research and engage in conversation with us. Today we are pleased to welcome Paula Cepeda, Had Hadas Kotek, Katerina Pabst, Kristen Surrett, who are authors of Gender Bias in Linguistics textbooks, and Hadas Kotek, again, Ricker Dockham, Sarah Babinski, and Christopher Geisler, who are authors of Gender Bias and Stereotypes in Linguistic Example Sentences. This 90 minutes uh, webinar um, will, will consist first of a presentation by our authors for about an hour, after which they will respond to your questions in a Q&A session for the final 30 minutes. You can submit your questions using the control panel on your screen. And so without any further ado, I will turn this webinar over to our authors. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, hello and welcome to our webinar. We're very excited that you're here with us. Um, today, you All right, great. Uh, so you will get a chance to hear from all of the authors of two papers that were published in the December 2021 uh, issue of Language. And as Mark just said, those were uh, Paula uh, Cepeda, Hadas Kotek, myself, and Kristen Soret uh, on the paper Gender Bias in Linguistics Textbooks, and um, Hadas Kotek, Rika Dockham, Sarah Babinski, and Chris Geisler on, uh, in Gender Bias and Stereotypes in Linguistic Sample Sentences. And both papers actually find significant gender bias and stereotypes in example sentences. The first one in linguistics textbooks and the second one in published research articles, all of which were published over the past 20 years. Before we proceed, uh, we would like to take the opportunity to briefly introduce ourselves, and I will um, start with that. My name is Katarina Pabst. I'm a PhD candidate in linguistics at the University of Toronto, and my research focuses on synchronic and diachronic patterns of variation and their social meaning. Hello, my name is Paula Cepeda. I'm a PhD in linguistics uh, with interests in syntax and semantics. I am the director of the Office of Postdoctoral Affairs at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, hello, I'm Hadas Kotek. Uh, I have a PhD in linguistics and my academic interests are in syntax and semantics and I am currently working as a linguist in the tech sector. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen Surrett. I'm an associate professor at Rutgers University in New Brunswick in New Jersey um, with a co-appointment in the Center for Cognitive Science. My research is in child language acquisition and development and in psycholinguistics with specializations in syntax semantics, semantics and pragmatics. Hi everyone, I am Ricker Dockham. I am visiting assistant professor in the linguistics department at Swarthmore College. Um, I, my research focuses on phonology and historical linguistics in Southeast Asia, as well as language documentation, among other things. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Babinski. I'm a PhD candidate at Yale University. Um, my research is on phonetics, uh, corpus linguistics, language documentation, um, and I focus on uh, mainly on Australian languages. And I'm Chris Geisler. I'm currently a postdoc in the English Language and Linguistics program at Heinrich Heine University Düsseldorf. Um, and I study phonetics and phonology of Tibetan and other languages. All right, on the next slide, we will show you a brief uh, roadmap for our presentation today. We will start with a little bit of background and motivation for the two studies, and then we will share uh, some main findings which the two papers have in common. Um, then we will discuss broader implications of our work. And as you can tell from our brief introductions, we're a pretty diverse group with diverse interests uh, within linguistics. Uh, and we kind of want to take some time to describe our motivations for the study, our positionality, and how we approached um, uh, the projects and why we think they're important. So we will close with that. And at the end, um, all seven of us will participate and, uh, in the Q&A and take questions. 
Um, uh, you can post questions throughout the webinar. Um, I think in the uh, questions box, we will collect these um, and address them at the end. If there's anything that you'd like to have clarified right away, that's also fine. Just let us know in that case. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so I will take a few minutes now to situate both of these studies that were published in language recently in context and uh, talk about how each of them came about. Um, they have a lot in common, but they're also uh, separate uh, projects uh, that we're representing today. Um, so both of these works were inspired by a paper published in Language in 1997 by um, Monica McCauley and Colleen Bryce. Um, that paper studied um, example sentences in syntax textbooks that had been published between 1969 and 1994. And at the time, that paper found widespread gender bias and stereotypes in example sentences. And so just to summarize a few of the findings, uh, one main finding is that male gendered arguments were overrepresented in the sentences that they had studied. Um, male gendered arguments were also more likely to be subjects and agents and to be referred to using pronouns and to have names. Um, we also found, or they found, um, stereotypes of both men and women of various kinds. So just to name a few, um, who engages in violence and who is in particular the um, offender, the uh, perpetrator of violence, who is in, described in situations that involve romance, who has occupations and what kinds of occupations, um, who deals with cars, who uh, reads and writes, who is referred to as someone's wife or mother or husband or father, um, situations that describe someone, someone's appearance. Um, and also importantly in the study, Macaulay and Bryce find that textbooks show both suggestive and explicit language in the example sentences that are used. And so um, if you're a linguist in the audience, I encourage you when I read a few of these to try to imagine what this is trying to illustrate and whether you could imagine an example sentence that illustrates the same point, um, but is maybe less, uh, less this. So, um, so just a few examples. Uh, so Harry watches the fights and his wife the soap operas. Um, every painting of Maya and photograph of Debbie pleased Ben. Um, she's fond of John naked. Um, not going to read the other two. Uh, you can read them for yourself. And again, ask yourself uh, what this is there for, to do and also what it does that is maybe not what it is intended to do. So at this point, another question that uh, we should address is why these studies, uh, both Macaulay and Bryce, and then later our study, uses example sentences as the object of the study. Um, and there are two main reasons for that. The first is that example sentences play a central role both in linguistic teaching and in linguistic research. Um, constructed example sentences are one of the main sources of data in various linguistic subfields. We use them to uh, support our arguments, to make points, to illustrate both what is possible and what is not possible in a particular language or for a particular construction. We cite these examples over and over again, sometimes even divorced from their original source, and we create them as paradigmatic examples from the literature of a particular phenomenon. Um, these examples convey perspectives on relations and content, and they are handed down to generations of linguists. And so if the content that we convey has implicit or maybe even explicit bias, we are in danger of perpetuating a cycle in our field. On a practical note, um, Example sentences are also easy to, for us to identify and to use as an object of study. They're really low hanging fruit. We can identify them in, uh, in papers pretty easily. We can also teach other team members, undergraduate students, how to deal with example sentences, how to uh, provide the kind of coding that we're interested in um, and so that we can have studies um, using research assistance. Um, for example, we can teach our undergraduate assistants what a subject argument or a non-subject argument is. Uh, we can teach them uh, when we want to care about if there is a violence in the, stud in the sentence. Um, these are things that uh, are readily available and easy for us to do. Um, we do want to note at this point um, that both Macaulay and Bryce and our papers, both of our papers, only represent male and female genders. Um, this is something that both sets of authors really thought about a lot and agonized over and consulted with uh, experts on. 
Um, it was not an easy decision. Uh, we know that when we do that, we are simplifying in a way that is simply false. There is not a gender bias in the real world. Um, we are very happy to talk about that more in the question period. Um, eventually, we were forced into this decision based on just what data was there, what existed in the samples that we were working with. And so that's what we represent and that's what we'll say throughout. Um, but again, we want to flag that um, even as we say it, we know that we are uh, we're saying something that is highly imprecise and um, marginalizes some individuals and some genders. Okay, so um, also on the way of background, uh, let's talk about the specific papers that were gathered here today to uh, to discuss. Um, so first paper, um, Sepeda uh, um, is a paper that started as uh, from a discussion um, within a meeting of the LSA's Committee on uh, Gender Equity and Linguistics, which was then Coswell, the Committee on the Status of Women in Linguistics and recently rebranded. Um, we had uh, we were interested at the time in asking what had changed since Macaulay and Bryce had published their paper since it was the 20th anniversary of that paper. Um, and it was at the time a part of a broader effort to address and evaluate gender distribution in the field. And so at the same time, Coggle was also um, involved in the creation of the guidelines for inclusive language. Um, there was a data collection um, <clears throat> effort from 50 or uh, more than 50 um, linguistic programs in North America to fill gaps in the LSA annual survey. Um, we were engaged in creating Wikipedia entries and in nominating uh, non-men or gender diverse linguists for awards. And so this fit into that effort um, as part of a um, as part of what the committee on uh, now the committee on gender equity was engaged in. Um, and as part of the study, we really chose to replicate Macaulay and Bryce and so to use a methodology that is very similar to what Macaulay and Bryce had used. Um, and as part of that, we examined a sample of 200 example sentences from each of six syntax textbooks that were published between 2005 and 2017. Um, we coded our um, noun phrases that we found in these examples in much the same way as Macaulay and Bryce. Um, so we cared about the gender of the example and um, the uh, syntactic position and uh, the uh, semantic role that was played, that an argument played in, in the example and uh, some other types of stereotypes, like is there violence, is there romance? Um, are we describing someone using a pronoun or uh, using a kinship term like mother or um, father? Um, and the coding itself was done by the authors uh, of the paper, since this sample is a manageable size. Uh, we'll see in the next slide that for the next paper, um, the size is much larger. And so at that point, we started using uh, research assistance. Um, we won't say much more about the methodology that we used. Um, we, we want to get to the results and talk about the implications. Uh, but again, this is something that we're happy to say more about in the Q&A. All right. Um, so, uh, um, the second paper um, that we're um, presenting here today, uh, Gender Bias and Stereotypes in Linguistic Example Sentences, was inspired by the first uh, paper I just discussed by uh, Gender Bias in Linguistics Textbooks. Um, the way this came about is uh, I was then teaching at Yale. Um, I presented the first work, this uh, gender bias and linguistics textbook in, in uh, a reading group. It generated a lot of really interesting discussion and interest among um, students. Um, all of the authors other than myself who are um, authors on this paper were then uh, students at Yale. Uh, a few of them have since graduated. Um, Sarah is about to graduate. Um, all of them are on the job market and all of them are wonderful individuals who you should hire. Um, along with Katarina, who is uh, also on the job market from the other paper and should also be hired. They are wonderful individuals. They are wonderful team members. They are good citizens of the community. Um, and I digress, but if you are someone who uh, has a job, consider these individuals. They're wonderful. Um, anyway, um, so what we decided to do was uh, take the study of textbooks and uh, expand on it in two ways. So for one, we were interested in uh, something that goes beyond this special genre of uh, teaching syntax. We, we were interested in what actually happens in, in linguistic research. Um, and then we were also interested in constructing a larger sample of data. 
And so what we did was we extracted all of the example sentences from three major journals, um, language, natural language and linguistic theory and linguistic inquiry, um, all of the papers that were published over the course of 20 years from uh, 97, which is the Macaulay and Bryce paper, um, and 2018, which is when we started to do the study, um, for a total of about 23,000 examples that we handled in about 900 papers. And so at that point, we um, hired um, a set of undergraduate research assistants who we trained who did the actual coding of individual um, arguments in these examples. Um, and so with that, I want to hand, uh, hand this over to Paola to say something more about um, the actual findings of these studies. Thank you, Hadass. Um, so both the textbook study and the journal study find that most problems that were present in the example sentences in the textbooks that Macaulay and Bryce analyzed in 1997 are still present in uh, the samples. And it's very interesting to remember that this year is going to be the 25th anniversary of uh, Macaulay and Bryce 1997. Um, male gender arguments are overrepresented and stereotypes of both women and men are perpetuated here. In this part of the presentation, we're going to show the distribution of arguments in both study samples so that together we can observe the trends that go beyond this imbalance in representation. Uh, please remember to keep in mind that, as was mentioned before, we don't endorse a binary um, view of gender, that we understand that the example sentences uh, do not reflect the full spectrum of gender identities. And uh, of course, we acknowledge that our categorization itself is, is imperfect. So we are on our finding number one, the textbook study sample contain 2019 third person arguments that were coded as female, like Mary or the queen, male, like John or the king, um, both, like the phrase John and Mary, ambiguous, like the janitor, and other, like the building. So um, we decided to focus on human arguments. 30.9% of these arguments were coded as male and 15.9% as female, which makes male arguments almost twice as common as female arguments. The textbook study focused on these arguments only, male and female, for a total of 1,262 arguments. The journal study, uh, following what we, the authors of the textbooks article learn, focus on human arguments. So they sampled 25,106 third person human arguments. 45% of them were coded as male and 22% were coded as female with a resultant ratio of 2.2 male arguments for every one female argument. The journal study also focused on these arguments only for the analysis. To observe the trends that go beyond this skew, we're going to show you proportions of numbers associated with factors such as grammatical function, thematic role, data sources, etc. So now you have um, some um, information about grammatical function by gender. The textbook study finds that 82.2% of male gender arguments and 72.3% of female gender arguments occur in subject position. This means that first, uh, male arguments are more likely to appear as subjects um, compared to female arguments. And second, that female arguments are more likely to appear in non-subject positions like direct or indirect object, for example, compared to male arguments. The journal study finds similar trends with 83% of male arguments and 79% of female arguments as subjects. Female gendered arguments are less likely to occur as subjects 
and more likely to occur in non-subject roles as compared to male gender arguments, just like with the previous study. Now we are going to examine thematic role by gender. The textbook study finds that compared to female gender arguments, male gender arguments are overrepresented as agents and as experiencers. In comparison, female gender arguments are more likely to be patients and recipients. In a similar way, the journal study finds that female arguments are overrepresented among patients and recipients, and male arguments are more likely to be agents and experiences. Ricker is going to continue with the findings. Thank you. So the next finding we wanted to point out is that if, just to notice how striking the, the similarity is across both types of data source. So in both the textbook study and in the journal study, the distribution of gendered arguments remains constant. There was slightly more variation between the different textbooks, um, but especially the three journals between language, linguistic uh, inquiry and natural language and linguistic theory, um, the ratios remain very, very similar across all three. So what this suggests is not only is it an issue across both of our both our pedagogical materials in the form of textbooks, of course, and in our research um, in the form of example sentences from these journals, but that if we if this is simply what is sort of easy for us to detect and uh, quantify, then it's probably a, a general issue in the field at large. The next finding is about the the language of the example sentences. So we didn't. In neither study broke uh, things out beyond just English versus uh, other languages, but uh, between English and non-English examples, uh, the pattern holds. So it is not the case that this is a language effect, uh, at least not an English effect, um, because we can observe it uh, more closely. If, if someone is interested in uh, breaking out some of the more frequent, uh, frequently cited languages in journals this would be an interesting study to do however we found that the uh, the numbers dropped very quickly beyond a, a very small number of frequently cited languages to the surprise of few um, but i think it's it's important to note that this is consistent across the the source the language of the example sentences themselves and next we want to uh, to point out the consistency over time that we observed, especially in the journal study. Um, so we talked about the 2.2 to 1 ratio of male gender to female gendered arguments um, and how this appears to have improved, improved a little bit over time, but not much. However, most of those gains are in fact explained by uh, not by females appearing more frequently in subject position, but mostly in object position. So it's an interesting uh, an interesting sort of nuance to the finding there. Even even when things seem to improve and they re basically haven't, um, that gets explained away by uh, by the discrepancy between the syntactic argument of the uh, position of the um, of uh, of the uh, example as well. Thank you, Ricker. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about the topic matter of these uh, example sentences. The purpose of an example sentence is generally to illustrate some aspect of the structure of that sentence. But in order to do so, the sent there needs to be a sentence that is about something. So we unsurprisingly perhaps find examples of uh, stereotypes and bias in that subject matter as well. This example uh, here is coming from the textbook study, although we have found similar results in the journal study. So in the textbook studies, uh, a good number of the example sentences involved books. People were reading books or giving books or sort of doing other things with books. If uh, the, the ratio of male to female subjects reading books is very strongly skewed towards male subjects. Um, that's 13 male subjects across the textbooks were reading books versus two female subjects were reading books. 
However, when the, the, the ratio is less skewed when it comes to handling books, with female subjects handling a books 11 times and male subjects handling books 30 times. Thus, while overall sentences involving books had an even stronger skew towards male gendered arguments uh, subjects than the data as a whole, we find that uh, female characters are, when they do interact with books, more likely to be not reading them than reading them. One of the study, one of the observations coming out of the Macaulay and Bryce study was about uh, topics of relating to violence and occupations. Um, this was observed in the textbook study, but here we're presenting data from the journal study. Remember that the uh, overall, the male arguments had about, uh, there were about two, uh, two to 2.2 .2 male arguments for each female argument in the data. We find that this overrepresentation is even farther for male, uh, male gendered arguments when it comes to sentences that involve violence in some form or involve having occupations in some form. In particular, the occupations are much more diverse for male arguments. This was uh, a particular finding in the textbook study that male arguments were more likely to have a wide range of different kinds of professions and um, female arguments had a smaller range, often tending towards uh, gender stereotyped ones like teachers and queens. For two more subject, uh, subject areas, topic areas, these are sentences where female characters are overrepresented in the journals study. Again, bear in mind that there was overall more than twice as many male arguments as there are female arguments. So it is very striking that there are precisely as many uh, female and male arguments in sentences involving romantic or sexual content, 201 female and 202 male. This, we can tell, uh, also suggests a uh, certain heteronormativity in the, uh, the example cited. In addition, and this is very striking. One of the few places we will find more female arguments than male arguments is when we look at those that are referred to by kinship terms. So there are actually more female arguments referred to by kinship terms than male arguments. This means uh, examples like someone's mother, someone's wife, or someone's husband, someone's father. So not only are female characters overrepresented relative to their proportion, they are overrepresented overall in terms of being likely to be referred to by their relationship to someone else. Now um, to Sarah to round out our summary of findings. Yes, so the last finding that we wanted to talk about was in the diversity of the use of different proper names in these example sentences. So um, one might want to use a proper name in an example sentence and any individual uh, linguist who comes up with many of them is likely to sort of rely on the same names over and over again. Um, but as we saw um, in the textbooks um, results on the left side here, um, this name is more often than not um, by quite a wide margin to be John for a male name or Mary for a female name. Um, and in this case, we have this table with um, what I believe is the sum total of all names used in the textbooks. Um, so you can see that um, the second most common male name is Bill, which has um, many, many fewer uh, examples than John um, with only 42. Um, and then it sort of goes down even smaller from there. So there are only five male names used in all of the textbooks uh, that were considered. Um, and in terms of female names, um, Mary is, uh, you know, about nine times as common as the second most uh, common female name, um, which is Jill, and there are only 10 examples of that. Um, and then we have, um, we have seven more names after that. Um, so the that last uh, 
Ro, Edith, Kim, Selma, Stacy, and Sue are each represented four times each. Um, and this is um, something that one may have noticed anecdotally in their own work or in reading papers, um, but is certainly true um, both in textbooks and in journals. So in the journals paper, we again find that John and Mary are by far the most common uh, male and female names uh, respectively. Um, and we find uh, again, some similar names popping up again. We have Bill and Peter again in the male names. Um, and we have uh, variations on Mary. We have Maria and Marie. Um, and we also have, uh, oh no, I guess we don't have Sally in the textbook names. Um, another thing to notice with these names is that most of them are very common um, Western or specifically more Anglo type names. Um, and there's much uh, less diversity in the choice of names than we would like. Um, in the journal's paper, uh, one of the top male, male names is uh, Zhang San, um, which actually is only so common because it comes up in the front matter of one of the journals. So it's just repeated over and over in this uh, identical front matter. Um, and so that's why it, it has such high numbers. Um, so there's really a, um, a discrepancy in uh, the choice of names. Um, and this is true across many, many authors, of course, because this is all the different authors of the textbooks, as well as the many authors of, of journals all sort of converge on John and Mary more often than not. Okay, so uh, that uh, concludes the summary of our results from these papers. Um, and just to sum up, um, you know, um, Suggestive language and uh, blatantly sexual examples are mostly gone from these samples. Um, so any individual example that you pick out from a journal or a textbook these days um, might seem perfectly acceptable. Um, but when we look in the aggregate, a clear pattern is emerging, um, which is that there is this overall robust skew toward male arguments over female arguments. Um, as well as the persistence of stereotypical choices of argument distribution. Um, and this is consistent over the venue, over the language of example, over time, um, and across many different authors. Um, so there's clearly a, a systemic issue that's persisting despite the fact that the uh, sort of more egregious um, examples um, seem to be mostly gone um, from our linguistics research these days. Um, and at this time, um, we're going to switch over uh, to um, each of the co-authors giving some individual reflections and discussion about um, this project, how they got involved, um, and, uh, you know, personal thoughts on uh, the impacts of this work. Um, so I believe we start with Ricker. Thank you. So one of the questions that's come up frequently as we've presented um, these papers at departments and at uh, events uh, around the country and maybe world at this point um, is, doesn't this simply reflect a reality of the world or maybe a reality of society? Is this really the problem of linguists to deal with? Um, and so we would argue that, yes, it is our problem to deal with. Um, and so one of the things that has often been suggested is that, well, you really need to look at naturalistic examples. So, you know, maybe we can control the constructed ones, but we can't really control the, um, the what exists, you know, from language documentation work or other sort of more naturalistic corpus data. Um, and so I just wanted to point out that, yes, it's more difficult for us to analyze this, but the, the robustness of these findings suggests that it is an issue beyond just, you know, syntax and constructed example sentences. And just because it's more difficult for us to, to measure those, which is something we tried and found to be, in fact, difficult, um, we can we can you know combat this kind of uh, imbalance. And so I wanted to take you know my opportunity to to point out that this is something that we have some agency in, and that we can use it. And so um, we feel like there are other ways we could explore the issue, but every everything we thought of to throw at the wall to look at basically reconfirms the same results again and again and again and so um we have you know we should use our our agency as linguists and as educators as researchers to have an impact here 
So then how does that translate to actual field work, documentation, you know, sort of more naturalistic settings where you're gathering data? Should we, I mean, certainly we can't be correcting someone midstream and telling them not to use that example sentence if they're suggesting data. And that's true, of course. And so we would suggest that you take, you keep these findings in mind and, um, and exercise the, the influence you do have as an elicitor and as an interlocutor in these kind of situations to guide the, the subject, you know, away from inappropriate topics. And even when those do exist in your, in data you've gathered, you have the choice in how you um, select which uh, select which examples to include in your published work or in your taught work, right? And so we can't really predict exactly which examples we cite end up in this canon of oft-cited example sentences that get quoted out of context forever. And so it just a little bit more thought we can uh, we can make a difference. Uh, thanks, I'll continue. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm a sociolinguist and in my work I've noticed very many similar issues um, in my subfield, um, uh, less explicit uh, uh, sentences, but like who do we quote when we illustrate linguistic features that, um, uh, that we study, for example, um, or how do these uh, um, sample sentences that we do use in sociolinguists uh, linguistics portray uh, the communities that we work with and as Ricker had already hinted at it's a little bit harder to actually aggregate over this kind of data in sociolinguistics just because I found there's fewer um, sentences uh, per paper we don't have as many illustrations um, in in written books uh, for example either so when I got involved in the project for me it was really important to kind of find a way to show that these issues exist and raise our awareness for these and uh, show how systemic they are, even if they're harder to find in some, some corners of linguistics than others. Um, another point that was really important to me was uh, really coming from my own experience as a course instructor. I've been a course instructor from my very first day in graduate school. I've also worked in educational development and very many new instructors don't have a lot of time when they first plan their courses. They get a lot of inherited material uh, including some of these uh, sample sentences that are passed on and on. And I feel like it's really important to, to raise awareness for these issues because it might not be the very first thing that, um, uh, that new instructors uh, pay attention to when they plan their classes. Um, so I feel like it's important that we integrate this into our training for early career instructors, also for those um, that are a little farther along and raise awareness for these kinds of issues. Um, and in our own practice, rethink the kinds of materials that we use um, and advocate for more training. So lots of universities nowadays do have um, training teaching centers that provide uh, advice with how to be more inclusive in our overall ap approach. But I do think it's important that we supplement that with very discipline specific information. And here is something that's really relevant for the field of linguistics as a whole. Right, so I wanted to talk a little bit um, going off of that, again, with um, talking about coursework. So in introductory linguistics classes, um, we do introduce this idea that language matters and it interacts with identity. Um, but coupling that with highly stere stereotypical and biased example sentences um, sends mixed signals. Um, so establishing gender equity and example sentences early on in coursework um, can help to create field-wide standards because um, at least the way that I think about it is that um, students in these intro classes and in their early um, like syntax or sociolinguistic work will just sort of unconsciously match the um, gender bias that they see um, in these example sentences. And if they then go on to publish journal articles, then they will continue to perpetuate that bias. Um, and then those making teaching materials based off of journal articles will then perpetuate that bias in their teaching materials. Um, so we sort of need to break that cycle. Um, and in this case, um, syntacticians um, can really lead the way for those outside of the subfield um, who are teaching syntax by, you know, especially when writing textbooks, um, as we saw, you know, 
that's where a lot of um, sort of intro linguistics um, instructors will be um, taking examples from if they are not themselves um, uh, very deep into this subfield. Um, and likewise for sociolinguistics and anywhere else that example sentences are used. Um, and basically, you know, linguists, um, as much as we would like to pretend that we are, we are not objective outside observers of language. Um, everyone brings their own biases to their work. Um, and so it's just important to recognize that um, and try to override them with when we can, and then it will become much easier to avoid these biases if it becomes um, sort of a field-wide standard in that way. I think a valuable one thing of note uh, about this project is that the ways in which our group of authors is diverse and the ways in which it may not be diverse. But one, th one way in which it is diverse is that we do have men here. And I think it's important as a person who has not faced gender discrimination that all of us, including men, take an active role in addressing gender equity. These problems are systemic and we are all the system. As a phonetician and a phonologist, I was also having interesting thoughts throughout this project about, well, how does this connect to my work? Because in my research and the kind of research I generally cite, we don't use a lot of example sentences, at least not of the type that are cited here. But we can find analogous situations in our own fields. For example, um, and thanks to Rosalind for pointing this out, in diagrams of the vocal tract, they're typically presented as a mid sagittal section, we call it, and that's presented as a silhouette of a person's head. Whose silhouette is that? Typically, it is a, well, not typically, in every example I have seen of a mid sagittal section used in instructive or um, publication purposes, that is a Western looking male looking head. In acoustic measurements that we make for papers or for presentation in um, pedagogical materials, whose voice is that? In interactive IPA charts, you know, where you can click to learn the sounds of the world's languages, you click on them, whose voice is that? It's often Peter Latifoged's, which I'm happy about, but of all, you know, these are the sounds of all people. And there has been uh, increasing interest in the field of speech technology to see, well, who is the training data composed of? Whose voices are that? Whose images are that? And what biases do our um, technological systems have as a result of the what we teach them? So I think this, um, the example sentences work is an opportunity um, for all of us in all of the different places we have in our life to encourage our reflection on the kinds of biases that we have in our own fields. Um, and those are biases in terms of gender and in other ways as well. I would like to address an interesting fact is that um, we, the authors of both studies, have focused on publications that are written in English. Right? But there are also studies that have focused on uh, linguistic publications that are written in other languages. So, uh, for example, in 2018, I um, did a quick study of Hispanic linguistics textbooks that are written in English and are used across universities in the United States. Um, just like um, the results that we just presented, I found that human arguments marked with masculine gender agreement occur twice as often as those marked with feminine. And they are again more likely to occur as subjects and agents and experiences and the stereotypes um are also present and men you know they are violent and women are very passive another study that is very interesting as well is the one um published by Rishi and Burnett in 2020 they studied um 
publications uh, in linguistic uh, journals written in French. And uh, what they found is even more striking. So the ratio uh, for the um, references to men and female, to men and women were four to one. And um, they also found that male gender arguments are more likely, once again, to appear as subjects, agents, and experiences. They have a second part of their study working on gender neutral um, masculine marked uh, now phrases because you know French just like Spanish they are um, gender marked language they have grammatical gender for all the nouns so this is interesting it's this is not something that is happening only you know in the field of linguistics in the publications that we are reading in English but it's happening in the field of linguistics in general so we have some examples about this and we can also say that it's happening in academia uh, in, in general, a disproportion um, in the representation of women, which is marking, you know, my second point that is about representation in general. So as, the, as one of the authors of the textbook study, I acknowledge that the concrete impact of the gender biased uh, examples uh, in the field hasn't been studied. So maybe that's a project that we should, you know, do next. Uh, there is evidence, though, that uh, representation is an important component uh, for a sense of community and belonging. And our publications are modeling our practices, the values of the field, the priorities of our field, and biases like gender ratio or any other form of discrimination can be read as a disregard for diversity. And we don't want that. that you know, this can be a gatekeeper. It can affect uh, our efforts to recruit talent for the field, you know, talent that can continue the field as lively as it is right now. So studies are needed on how the implicit and explicit content, uh, content of our textbooks are affecting the gender configuration of our disciplines. That will be interesting to know as well. And uh, one last point that I want to um, mention is um, a reflection on intersectionality. So how an individual might be discriminated against or put in disadvantage by overlapping systems of oppression. Um, for example, a Latino woman, and I'm, a, and I'm a Latina, a Latino woman may experience gender and racial discrimination. Right. But their experience of gender discrimination is different from that of a white woman. And their experience of racial discrimination is different from that of a Latino man. So studies like the ones that we're presenting today are super, super important because they, uh, this is a wake up call. They are calling for all of us to keep in mind that representing only certain groups, like westernized groups or white middle class, able-bodied heterosexual groups, uh, this is not the way for us to achieve equality. And in particular, for those of us who are educating, you know, the next generation of professionals in the field. All right, thank you, Paola. Um, so I want to take this perspective and uh, and kind of run with it. Um, so as, as a woman syntactician, this work resonates with me on, on many levels. And I was trying to kind of imagine and think back to when was the first time that I felt this kind of um, this skew in, in gender in, in my environment. And it's honestly really hard to think about when this started. Um, so um, just starting from my graduate school career, um, I was the only woman in my cohort of, of seven students. Um, after I graduated, I was very often one of the only um, faculty, uh, female faculty in syntax and semantics reading groups and um, could feel myself being kind of looked at as the representation of women in, in a group, even when I was only intending to represent myself. Um, and maybe more importantly, I was, uh, frequently, much more frequently than I would have liked to be uh, the only woman on shortlists and uh, the statistics on women being hired off of shortlists that have a single woman on them is really not lost on me and it was 
um, a continuous uh, discouraging uh, factor in my life um, at the time. Um, but of course, this is not special and, and specific to linguistics or to academia even. Um, and now that I, I work in the tech sector, um, it's also clear to me that there is bias that is evident and widespread there. Um, and in particular in leadership positions, so the higher up you go, the more you look at higher managers, the more not diverse um, it becomes and kind of the more discouraging it becomes, um, which leads me back to um, a conversation I have sometimes with people who say, well, you look at example sentences in textbooks or in, in an article, is that really going to solve the problem? Um, and, and, you know, no, in, in a sense, it's not like if we were, we had perfect example sentences, then everything would be solved. Um, but, um, but it's a start. And as it turns out, even that start is, is not obvious. So staying, uh, speaking for myself as someone who's thought about this work for quite a long time, um, even just trying to do better in terms of the names that I choose has been not obvious, has been hard for me. Um, so I come from a tradition uh, where um, John, Mary, Bill, and Sue in that order has been ingrained in me in, in many, over many years. And so when I teach, um, I, I, you know, if, I, if I'm on the spot kind of reaching for a name, I reach for John, that is the first name that comes to mind. So, um, it has been work even for me to prepare for myself some other names and to uh, consciously say, I'm going to think beyond the obvious thing and I'm going to take the extra second and I'm going to reach for that other name or even maybe stop and explain to the students, to the class, why I'm doing that. I put John on the board and I'm going to erase that name and I'm going to use another name and I'm going to tell you why I did that because that is important. Um, and again, it's not like that is going to solve everything. Um, but but that's a start, and it, it it signals something to students, and it signals something to other members of the field when I do even just that much. Um, and then I also want to say, as the uh, incoming chair of the Committee on Gender Equity in Linguistics, um, that if that sounds like not enough for you, there is a whole lot of other things that you could be doing, and Kristen will spend a bit of time saying more about that too. Um, but just to describe what Coggle has been doing or is doing in 2022, um, we have a big data initiative trying to think about who's being represented in various ways, like in talks and journals and um, in handbook articles and hiring com and, uh, search committees. Um, we have a group that is interested in um, producing materials specifically for first generation linguists, uh, students and faculty. And of course, that goes beyond just gender. Like um, Paola was saying, there is, um, there is a lot of intersection between being a minority of one kind and uh, being a minority of a different kind. So being a woman and being first generation here. Um, that's been a super active and nice group to work with. Um, we've been interested in thinking about the effects of COVID on linguists, and that's not something that only affects women, but we do know it affects women um, more than it affects other people, and that's, that's really important. Um, we have a group that is creating resources, written resources, guidebooks for uh, how to run inclusive conferences and um, thinking at the moment on, about virtual conferences, which if you attended the LSA annual meeting, um, you might imagine is, uh, could be useful, uh, could have been useful to have before. Um, we continue to work on pop-up mentoring, um, this um, initiative that uh, pairs people who may not otherwise have access to these kinds of resources um, with, with one-time mentors to have a conversation. Uh, we continue to have wiki edit-a-thons. I should look forward to having an announcement for International Women's Day um, in, in just a few weeks. We'll have another event like that. Um, we continue to nominate women for awards and we've seen successes there. Um, if you have a thought for a different initiative you want to uh, have our support for, um, we, we do a lot of work. We welcome everyone. It's an open committee. Everyone can join. So you can start from just thinking about your example sentences or you could think about how you might spend more time doing more things. Um, there is, there is always, we're always welcoming of everyone who, who wants to participate in that. Um, and I will turn it over to Kristen. So I, I want to say that uh, I feel like there should have been a mic drop after uh, Paola's sharing because uh, she just said such beautifully profound um, things and I'm, I'm so privileged to be part of this group and hear from such amazing researchers who are colleagues and friends and peer mentors in the field and I want to echo also what you know was said earlier we have lots of people who are on the job market in here so um, you know this we, we want to highlight the 
potential contributions of junior scholars in this group as well. Um, I came to this work as a woman academic and researcher. Um, I've personally encountered over the course of my, my career uh, quite a bit of gender bias um, and marginalization across various aspects of my experience. Um, as someone who works in semantics, um, interfacing between semanticists and philosophers um, is, is always fun. Um, and I feel uh, a tension constantly between the fields of psycholinguistics and language acquisition on the one hand, and the fields of semantics and pragmatics and philosophy on the other. Um, within psycholinguistics and language acquisition, we know that there is a larger proportion of women. Um, and it's not just the number of women versus number of men, it's women who are actively uh, writing, um, serving as mentors, serving as advisors, who are modeling that kind of work-life balance that we so we work so hard to to um, try to achieve. Um, and so I've been incredibly privileged as someone who works in psycholinguistics and language acquisition to be surrounded by amazing, amazing women and by amazing men who are allies. Like I can't say enough about how happy I am with those subfields. And I, and I feel very um, privileged being someone who's in semantics and pragmatics um, to have had close friendships and mentorships um, and, and interactions with some very strong, um, wonderful women researchers and again, some male allies. But I do find that I'm combating this gender bias much more in those subfields. And when I teach pragmatics to an undergraduate class, actively having to change the example sentences that I use, especially when I talk about presuppositions, for example. Um, I also actively mentor undergraduates and graduates and junior faculty as a, as a, a means to try to combat that kind of gender bias and marginalization. Hadas mentioned the pop-up mentoring program that a number of us here on the panel um, helped to, to launch, um, which has been widely successful. Um, so, Personally, I've, I've experienced this myself, and I'm not someone who is Latina. I'm not someone who's African American. And if I'm experiencing it as a white woman, for sure, it's much worse for a larger contingent of people in our field. Um, as a tenure track faculty member at, at Rutgers, as somebody who is the principal investigator of a lab and currently I've been serving for a few years now as the undergraduate director in our department, um, I've had a lot of ways in which to encounter implicit bias rearing its head. And it comes up in ways that you might find to be unexpected. You know, example sentences are one area. And again, you might think this is a tiny little thing, but it's actually pervasive. You know, this is part of the, the main empirical data that we use to draw in undergraduates to our field. And so I see time and time again for the undergraduates that I teach, who are research assistants in my lab, who are students in my classroom, who come to me during student support hours, even if I'm not teaching them, um, if they don't feel represented, they don't feel heard, they don't feel seen, they don't feel like they have a place in the pipeline in our field. That's a challenge. If you're somebody who is a native Mandarin speaker, if you are a heritage speaker of Spanish, um, and you feel like you're constantly surrounded by example sentences and materials that exclude you or don't at, at minimum acknowledge your presence, that's a barrier. So and it, within my department, I've chaired and served on a number of search committees, actually for five of my junior colleagues and one senior colleague in my department right now. We're a small department, so that's like half of the department. Um, so being on those search committees, I've consistently worked towards establishing best practices and interviewing and hiring, confronting implicit bias. Um, I've, I've brought diversity and inclusivity into a regular part of our de department dialogue, and that takes work, y'all. That takes a lot of work consistently, um, but it's, it's important work to be done. And again, going back to example sentences, it's a way to, to highlight one very like low-hanging fruit that we can highlight to say, look, it's here, where else might it be? Um, at Rutgers, I also co-direct the Language and Social Justice Initiative, and I'm a member of the Inclusive Pedagogy Task Force as part of our university-wide academic master plan. Um, so I've had a 
wonderful chances to dialogue with people across departments who work on disabilities, um, who work in higher education, who work in career explorations and success. And I've seen just how important it is for us as linguists to highlight the role of language in supporting social justice and supporting all of those diversity, equity, and inclusivity measures and initiatives that universities um, around the nation are engaged in. Um, we all have a chance to say, look, if you're not putting names like Javier and Melinda and Jure is in your example sentence, it's like, what are you communicating if it's always John and Mary and Sue, right? Um, but more importantly, you know, looking at those course materials, those reference lists, how diverse are they? Are you are you acknowledging the researchers who are doing the heavy lifting and who are doing the, the exciting work in the field? Are you always going back to a classical canon that's easy to cite? Um, and finally, um, I've served as an associate editor and a reviewer in major journals and grant proposals. So for example, I've been an associate editor at Language Acquisition, uh, at Language, and at Semantics and Pragmatics. Two of those are LSA journals. Um, and I'm also on the editorial board of Journal of Child Language and been on the NSF grant panel. In all of these places, I've encountered implicit and explicit bias. In the manuscripts I'm reviewing, in the reference lists I'm seeing, in the example sentences, um, in the authors, in the order of the authors. Um, and so I'm, I'm feel very, um, I feel very proud that I've worked alongside of other editors and researchers who are, who are reviewers who acknowledge the importance of having a double blind review process um, in having an open and honest conversation with authors about the kinds of materials they're using and why it's that important to really do this kind of grassroots, grassroots work um, to address this. So where do we go next? Uh, we have some very simple recommendations. Uh, be considerate and conscious and conscientious of your choices. Uh, we've highlighted statistically significant trends that demonstrate how important it is to pay attention to the names you're using, the predicates you're using, the roles in which you're placing people, um, looking at that relationship between syntactic arguments and semantic roles. Um, be considerate of inclusion of multiple cultures, races, ethnicities, ethnicities and other characteristics, um, and make your classes and your scholarship um, inclusive. Uh, Paula, since you're in charge of our Q&A document, I've included some links that I uh, would like to invite you to share to, um, with everyone who is attending um, so that you could be involved in some of the committees in the LSA who are doing this really important work like causal, um, COGGLE, <laughs> and SOTL. <laughs> so these are like fun acronyms, but these are really great ways for you to get involved, especially the scholar, um, scholarship of teaching. Um, we want to be clear, stereotypical language, ex sexually explicit and demeaning language, and language reflecting biases, it's often easily avoidable, and so it should be avoided. Uh, the use of gendered lexical items, something I've been combating for a while now in the Guidelines for Inclusive Language and a lot of the advocacy, advocacy I do, that's easily avoided as well and should be. And the biased and elevated frequency of particular gendered noun phrases and particular syntactic positions or semantic roles should also be diminished. We also invite you to embrace inclusive language. It's not just about what you avoid, it's what you welcome. So acknowledge using singular they. I mean, this shouldn't be a thing, right? It's it's been around, we all use it, even if we don't realize we're using it. We're often told that, you know, he should be the default pronoun. That's just ridiculous. Like, don't do that anymore. Um, despite, uh, you know, despite all of that, um, you know, the, the, the pronoun feels exclusionary of non-male individuals. So, um, you know, we, we just want you to encourage, to encourage you to use singular they, like, why not? And plus, it was the word of the decade. Sarah, I think I'm passing it on to you. Right, so um, where are we going next with this? Um, so some recommendations um, for uh, instructors, um, choose your examples wisely. Um, try not to perpetuate this uh, gender bias and uh, racial bias and um, 
everything that we've just talked about. Um, be sensitive at how you're portraying individuals in terms of using stereotypical um, situations as your example sentence. Um, and keep in mind that you are in a position of authority um, and can have a positive influence on the students um, that you're teaching who may then go on to enter the field in a professional capacity. Um, and uh, on top of that, also consider the gender ratios and uh, representation in your syllabi as well. Um, so who are you citing? Um, and for authors um, related to uh, journals and textbooks, um, be thorough, inclusive, and balanced in your citations. Um, don't perpetuate biases in the examples that you're citing, um, which may take, you know, uh, looking beyond the first example that comes to mind that everybody cites or something like that, um, or maybe modifying an example. Um, and keep um, the uh, LSA guidelines for inclusive language in mind when you're uh, when you're writing anything. Um, for TA uh, supervisors, uh, as well as mentors, um, raise awareness of these issues among your mentees. Um, so try to, you know, pay it forward um, so that everyone is sort of thinking about these things as they um, enter the field and start teaching more often. Um, and for editors and reviewers, um, also pay attention to the examples and uh, language that authors are using um, and point it out, um, you know, in the revision process. Um, and maybe you can uh, sort of have a positive impact there. Um, and really, these issues of representation clearly go beyond example sentences, although that's what we were focusing on here. Um, so just a few additional examples. Who are you citing in your papers? Um, who do you teach in your classes? Who do you invite to give talks? Um, who are you uh, inviting to contribute to handbook articles? Um, so who are you giving these opportunities to? Um, and who are you uh, promoting um, in, your, in your work? Um, and another uh, thing we wanted to mention was um, conferences. So um, the REAL guidebook, Resources on Equity and Inclusion in Linguistics, um, gives advice about um, inclusive conferences um, and includes things like accessibility, uh, uh, standards about name tags, um, breastfeeding stations, um, running an inclusive question and answer period, um, and many more things. So definitely um, check that out and maybe we will uh, share that link in the chat as well. Okay, then I think uh, Katarina will take us to the end. Yes, thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, so one thing that has come up time and again really is that these patterns that we see in our data don't really stand in isolation. They reflect broader attitudes that we see in the field and who is welcome or made feel welcome. And we would like to end with a brief look at how the issues of representation actually extend to hiring in the field. So the chart on this slide actually shows uh, a breakdown of job types by gender in 2019 for all departments that are registered in the LSA online job um, directory. And as you can see uh, on the slide, men make up a, a larger percentage than women in tenure track and tenured positions, whereas women uh, are more highly represented in part-time or non-tenure track work. Um, I, I should say, uh, in addition to that, that women in total uh, held more uh, positions in uh, the field in general, but especially in these other um, full-time positions with, uh, with non-permanent contracts a lot, and they never really exceeded in the same period of time that we see represented here from 2013, or this is from 2019, but looking at data from 2013 to 2019, they never exceeded um, uh, men in the rank of full professor or even assistant professor. So I want to put these numbers a little bit into perspective for you, because in that same period that I just mentioned from 2013 to uh, 2019, we see that women have consistently um, uh, gotten more advanced degrees, more doctorates in linguistics than men. One thing that I also want to point out in this context, um, of course, that Again, we only have data on this false gender binary. We have no um, uh, or very little idea of the number of, um, of individuals that uh, do not fall within this binary. We have very little data on representation from um, 
uh, non-white uh, students pursuing degrees because these numbers are so low, reflecting that we need to change our practices in the field. One thing that I want to make quite clear is that we're not arguing that um, uh, the representation of, of uh, or gender bias that we find in, in example sentences directly leads to this. Rather, we want to show that um, this kind of gender bias that we find in, in research and teaching rears its head in many different ways within the field. Um, and it's our task, because these, these biases are systematic, which we hope to have shown in the course of this webinar and with, with our papers, but we are the system. So it's up to us to really admit, train, and hire individuals that reflect the diversity, both of our students, but also uh, the societies that we are a part of. And that's what I want to close with. Thank you very much. We look forward to your questions. We've already gotten quite a few, and I think Paola will guide us through those. Yes, thank you, Katharina. Uh, we're going to answer your questions as they came, so in that order in particular. I'm going to start with the first one. Um, the first question uh, included also uh, a thank you. It says, thank you so much for the very important, for this very important work, the work that Cargill does with increasing visibility of women linguists on Wikipedia makes me wonder if anyone has examined gender bias in the examples used on Wikipedia. This will be another great place to improve inequity and, or improve equity uh, in that case. I, it may ultimately reach an even larger audience. Um, Kristen, can you please address that? Well, I'll address it, but I, I have to say, I don't know of anyone who's doing that work and that's a really excellent suggestion. I will say when we've hosted the Wikipedia edit-a-thons, um, you know, of course, Gretchen McCulloch had been, has been amazing um, in, in kickstarting that, um, but the, the Wikipedia team is actually really great at supporting those efforts as well. Um, so I, I would suggest reaching out there, um, you know, to, to see if there has been that kind of work done. But, you know, this is just one of many places where we should be tracking this kind of data. So great suggestion. And I think there's one of many places where we can look. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, regarding the results, any correlation with the gender of the authors? So maybe for the text box, Katharina? Uh, yes, sure. So for the textbooks, uh, I just want to emphasize we were looking at six textbooks. So I think um, it's difficult to uh, make any claims or rather impossible about uh, representativeness just because it's so few authors. Uh, one thing that we did find is that overall, um, uh, the gender presentation of the authors did not seem to influence the patterns. Uh, the one thing that we did notice is that there was one feminine presenting uh, author. And when I say feminine presenting, that is because um, some of these authors uh, are known to us as the researchers, but we did not ask them for their gender. So we're going on uh, their gender presentation. Uh, and one of the feminine pre uh, presenting authors uh, did have slightly less um, uh, uh, bias patterns in the English examples and not uh, in the other languages. What we made of that is that it's possible that this author may have been aware of these issues in the field because we know we've had Macaulay and Bryce around um, for now almost yeah, uh, 25 years. Um, but it's more of an issue uh, or may have been more of an issue for this individual uh, to rectify the situation in the non-English example sentences. Because of course, when you're an author and you're writing a, a linguistics or a syntax textbook, you will not necessarily speak all of the languages that are represented in your data. So coming up with alternative examples in other languages um, uh, is of course a challenge, which, uh, which leads to, you know, more attention to the fact that we have all of these examples illustrating phenomena from certain languages that get passed on and on and on. And it's up to us to, to do better in the future and of, of course um, uh, rectify this issue, which um, uh, can be hard for uh, an individual to do if they're not familiar uh, with other examples from the languages they wanna illustrate. Thank you, Katharina. For the same question, you know, any correlation with the gender of the authors? Rickard, could you please give the perspective for the uh, journal study? 
Sure, yeah. Um, so we actually looked at that in two different ways. Um, first of all, we looked at the proportion of female authors in the journals over time. Um, and of course, there's variation from year to year, but we looked at the um, at the regression and we found basically there is a, a, a leveling off of uh, female authors around 40% since 2005. So there was some change in the early years where this is a 20 year range of the study. Um, but since the 2.2 to 1 ratio of male gender to female gendered authors is stable over time, that suggests that the, the, the gender of the author and their proportion within the journals doesn't impact that ratio. So that's one way. We also look at the data directly, having, uh, again, with imperfect coding, uh, attempted to code to the best of our knowledge the, the, the gender um, presentation of the, of the authors in the journals. And we found that uh, female authors use female arguments slightly more often than male authors. That's true, but it was at a level below statistical significance, so it was virtually the same. Thank you, Victor. We have another question, um, this time regarding names. So I figure that, that you refers to all of us authors. What do you think uh, the significance of the findings about names is. Chris? Sure. Um, I assume I'm reading this question to mean the names of the arguments in the example sentences. And I think that speaks to a, well, as we've, as we've discussed it, as we speaks to how we fall back on the familiar and the automatic. Um, sometimes that is unconscious and sometimes that's deliberate. I think some folks do deliberately pick John and then secondarily John and Mary as their examples. Um, but it's, it's a, as I see it, it's an example of the entrenchment of um, how we reproduce what we have been exposed to in the past. Thank you. There is another question here for um for our authors. What about using the same examples but switching the names? Sarah? Right. So um, I'm assuming that this means switching, um, for example, if you have a male subject and a female object, that you switch it to be a female subject and a male object. Um, this would help, of course, with the um, grammatical function uh, skews that we saw, it would help in some ways. Um, but I do want to point out that um, in terms of uh, content uh, results that we talked about, it wouldn't necessarily help with that. So let's say in general, we maybe want to avoid all violent uh, situations, um, you know, whether that is violence against women or violence against uh, a man, you know, that might be something that we want to avoid in all situations. Um, another issue is in our sort of romantic and sexual situations. Um, we noted that there was probably a lot of heteronormativity in those, which is why we got basically equal examples of male and female arguments. So that really wouldn't do anything to help that. Um, it certainly is a, a first step, but I think also just thinking more holistically about the kinds of example sentences that you're writing is probably um, the best option. Thank you. So our next question is amazing work. Thanks. I'm curious as to why you listed Kim as a female name. So that's for the textbooks um, study. Uh, when although I also find it to have female connotations, my understanding was that it's used as a unisex name like Chris or Sandy. Relatedly, if your example sentences don't contain pronouns, What's the best way to reduce the binary gender categorization that you found? Um, Chris? Sure, as a Chris, I can attest that most of the folks I've encountered, anecdotally, anecdotally, um, in my life are, um, are folks who, who were male. It's the male version of the name. It was, Christopher was the second most popular uh, male name in the United States in the year I was born. Um, the Christines and Christinas were, uh, are popular, but much lower. Um, I think, and that that speaks to something that has been documented in research. I don't have the references on hand, um, but that um, 
it is it is generally shown that there is a, a bias that when a uh, a person is exposed at least in english in uh, north america uh, when a speaker is exposed to a presented with a name that is one of these suppo uh, uh, allegedly non-gendered names they often do uh, have a have a, a gender association with them the um, I can't speak to the Kim as the for the textbook study because I didn't do it. I imagine that that was the kind of reasoning they used. But for the um, for this kind of question for the journal study, we were relying on the judgments of our coders who were undergraduate students at a U.S. university, um, linguistics majors and minors, and some related fields like cognitive science, and. When they asked us about this question, we told them that yes, to do your best, but that their automatic perception of the name's gender is important. Um, because if they're reading it, then likely some, if they're reading Kim as female, then likely someone else will as well. Um, uh, as for the, the question about uh, not containing pronouns, um, reduced binary gender categorization to find. Yes. Sample sentences don't contain. Um, so you can include pronouns. First of all, we've said singular they. We love singular they. This can be for named individuals as well. Um, and it can be for non -na not named individuals like the doctor consulted their records about something. Um, so they can they can be for specific known individuals to encourage that use as well as right the um, the other use of singular they of uh, you know someone's at the door I don't know uh, what they're asking for um, and it's also worth pointing out that there is a lot of really awesome relevant research about this um, and um, I don't know there was some discussion in the side chat that we might share some of that um, but this is a rich field of inquiry. Thank you, Chris. Um, Kristen? I wanted to point out that this issue of uh, using names like Chris and Kim um, was originally a recommendation um, in order to avoid uh, explicitly gender biased names. But when we revisited the guidelines for non sexist usage and um, introduced the guidelines for inclusive language, we uh, removed that recommendation precisely because names don't tend to be uh, entirely unambiguous in practice. They still do strongly skew towards certain assumptions about gender. Um, so, you know, we're not recommending that you use names that might just have no gender associated because it's not actually um, possible in all cases. I, I did want to jump down, even though we're handling the questions and the order in which they were received. I did want to jump down to the very last one we received because we're running out of time. Monica McCauley is in the audience, y'all. And um, so I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and Monica says, um, you know, thank you for this. Uh, gratified to see the work, but not so much to see the results. Um, we hear you. Um, and she did say that, Chris, she saw a sagittal section that was stereotypically female. Um, and it may have been in Frumpkin and Rodman, Rodman's intro textbook. Um, you know, if it's in there, that's wonderful. But you know, nice, nice reply to something you had said earlier. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you, Monica. Hi. Um, just quick question uh, because we don't want to, you know, skip over any question. But I think this was already answered. Um, the question is, as someone who has attended a university in Italy, I wonder if such a study might be expanded to textbooks in languages other than English. Uh, Katharina? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's a really good point. And I don't know exactly when the question came in, if it was before uh, Paula's little uh, reflection, because Paula mentioned there has been some follow-up work done by Paula herself on uh, Spanish textbooks in use in the US. There's also some uh, work by uh, Richie and Burnett on um, uh, the same issue in French journal articles. So I think there's uh, uh, lots of possibilities. And I think uh, what all of these uh, studies that have been already done have shown is that the same patterns persist across 
uh, these um, are, I mean, admittedly, um, uh, 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 Western uh, European uh, uh, languages um, that are used, but I think it's it's definitely uh, important to keep looking. And as Kristen said, as we discussed the possibility of looking at um, gender bias in example sentences on Wikipedia, I think it's important that we do keep looking in those materials that uh, uh, we use in research and teaching. So I think it's a great idea to extend that even more. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time. So I, unfortunately, I think this is gonna be our very last question. Um, so, uh, 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 yeah, well, this is a question with a name, Jason Chen from Indiana University of Bloomington. Thanks for the insightful talk. Uh, so thank you. Um, and there's a question that says, uh, I have to be honest, I do not think that changing example sentences in textbooks is going to be any sort of catalyst for equity in linguistics. No young BIPOC, BIPAC, that's a uh, linguist, is going to feel seen by seeing uh, more sentences that have a woman as an agent. I think the more pertinent issue is getting and encouraging more women, non-binary and BIPOC, to uh, be more visible, uh, to, uh, to more visible places. Have you thought about more concrete ways you could encourage actual diversity in linguistics and actual, you know, came with uh, stars? Uh, especially in academia. Kristen? So I want to be clear that uh, I don't think anyone in this group said that this was a catalyst for change or that it was a replacement for any other strategy. It's one means of uh, systematically evaluating the empirical data in our field and the kinds of informations and relationships that we're portraying to our undergraduate students and other members of our field. Um, I don't think that being a BIPOC linguist is mutually exclusive with being someone who is um, a woman, for example. And so um, I do think that anyone in the field who sees themselves represented in reference lists, in example sentences, in discussions, in short lists for the job market, the list goes on and on and on. If you see yourself represented across different aspects of the field, then you do feel more seen. And I have heard this said to me over and over again by the students that I work with. Um, so we are addressing this as one you know, tiny bit of, of data that we can look at, example sentences, um, which we're not seeing as a replacement for numerous other strategies that members of our field and members of higher education in general have um, undertaken in order to increase diversity. And I know myself and every other member of this panel um, has been actively working um, to promote diversity in real substantive ways. Um, and so I would encourage everyone to, again, look back at those, um, those links that we've shared for being active in committees that um, are actively trying to increase diversity. CEDL is, is one that we haven't um, linked here. If Paula, if you're able to link CEDL, um, that's the Committee on um, Ethnic Diversity and Linguistics, so CEDL, Causal, and Coggle. Um, and I would also say the Scholarly Teaching with Linguistics um, at SIG, those are great committees to be a part of that are doing real beautiful, meaningful work and have been doing so for a while. And I would encourage um, members of our field to take an active role in those committees. Thank you, Kristen. Um, we're running out of time. We really appreciate your attendance and your questions. Unfortunately, there are more questions that we couldn't answer, um, but reach out to us. Please read our articles. And if you have anything more to say, just we're here to open, uh, very open and, and to improve our field. That's the important thing. Thank you so much and see you around. <laughs>
thank you to everyone for being a part of this. Thank you to our panelists for such an excellent presentation. And uh, once we end this recording, it, the webinar will end somewhat abruptly for everyone. So I just wanted to give you all a heads up about that. So thanks again for coming and we'll see you all next time.